let's look at what an account balance looks like. You will have an opening balance, potentially. After the opening balance, there will be additions that took place during the year and potentially disposals or removals. Then you're going to have subsequent measurements per IFRS. And then you will have your closing balance. And this is what it's going to look like. Opening balance plus additions, less disposals or removals, less subsequent measurements gives you your closing balance. This is the amount that sits in the financial statement. This is the amount you're auditing. It is literally a balancing figure. It's not its own amount. It got to this amount because of this adjustment here. That IFRS subsequent measurement made sure that this amount here is the right value per what IFRS requires. So opening carries from prior years. Additions, any kind of addition is new items. Disposals is removing of items. These both are transactions. And your subsequent measurement is to make sure the value at your end is correct. So look here. When you have to audit an addition or disposal, which is your transactions, an addition being a new, le uh, new lease contract or a new loan um, or the disposal of a asset, the disposal of a subsidiary, whatever it is, those are transactions. Those need to be audited using your assertions that we've just covered, the class of transaction assertions. What did we have? We had, about, we had six assertions because we had uh, standard and we had presentation disclosure. So for each of those, you could get about 10 marks to audit using class of transaction assertions alone. Account, the opening balance is new. This is new to a total amount. Because remember, when we did our class of transactions, there was no opening. It was only the total for the year. So this is now new because we've got a balance. Opening balance is new. And now subsequent measurements is new. Subsequent measurements is saying these new additions were brought in at cost or whatever initial recognition per IFRS and now they maybe need to be amended. It also says what about the opening balances? That also is going to have to be subsequently measured so that this final amount is what IFRS says. Okay, so now we're looking at an account balance, guys, you could get asked an account balance for 10 marks, which is purely asking you just your account balance, and you're going to put down those specific assertions. Or you could get asked to order an account balance for 50 marks. That's when you know you've got to go and do all of your class of transaction assertions to test additions, all of your class of a transaction assertions to test disposals, and then you will do the rest of your account balance assertions for that closing balance. Okay, so general procedures, the new things we're going to have to touch on. First new thing is the fact that there's an opening balance. So I'm going to have to agree the opening balance to the prior year financial statements closing balance. Now I've made sure that at least it carries forward. I'm going to do the rest of my general procedures. So now I'm going to do the closing amount. Agree the closing balance to the current year 
financial statement. So that's right in terms of my general procedures. Cost, you can see there's a calculation here. There's opening plus additions, minus disposals, minus sub subsequent measurements, even though I'm closing. So you got a calculation you're going to have to cost, and you can scan for unusual items. Get my management rep letter. All the relevant assertions. And then do analytical procedures. which are your comparisons to test reasonability. So compare the prior year balance to the current year balance and any other comparisons you want to do. You can do as an analytical. Compare this balance to the market's balance to see if this does appear to be reasonable. I would generally say give about, give about two examples for analytical to get your maximum marks. Because remember when we're doing and when we're going to test something that is specific in terms of reasonability like your assumptions and estimates, then you're going to do a little bit more of an analytical to see if it is reasonable. And so it's closing amount here. And what are the risks with that? Well, ultimately, there's a risk that there's items in here that shouldn't be here. Now, we're not talking necessarily additions or disposals because those would have been tested through class of transaction. Somehow, there's items in here that shouldn't be there. So they don't actually exist. So we'll do the existence assertion first. And it says, management give us the existence assertion to say all... Our assets exist and all our liabilities exist. So existence applies to all balances. And therefore, the risk is that they have recorded a balance that doesn't exist. And therefore, they have overstated it. How could it be? could have been stolen. They haven't removed it because they didn't know it was stolen, so they've overstated. It could have been disposed of and they didn't remove it, so now it's included and it shouldn't be there. Okay, they could have recorded a fictitious addition upon initial recognition, but now it still forms part of the balance at year end and therefore it doesn't exist at year end. Okay, I think just have a look here quickly, guys. This addition and this display, this and these disposals, as transactions, they're based on when they were initially recorded. Remember, I said to you, they would still be subsequently measured because from the date of when they were purchased, they would have been depreciated or amortized or impaired, and so there would still be a subsequent measurement. So, if they've recorded an addition here that shouldn't be here. Upon initial recognition, it's a fictitious transaction, but upon year-end balance valuation, it is also still fictitious, so it doesn't exist. So even though the transaction itself would be wrong, now it does still affect your balance. Okay, so it's going to be twofold here. So they've recorded an item in that balance that doesn't exist. So what are we going to do? We're going to have to test that there isn't anything there that shouldn't be there. We're going to have to see. Is it physical? Because if there's a physical item, it's a, or, or if there are physical items, it would be easy enough to pick up that they've recorded a physical item that doesn't exist. If it's not a physical item, is there any other way in which we can get evidence that it does exist? So, for physical items, remember, it's recorded, it's in there, but it shouldn't be there. How do I know when it should be there? There would be a source document. So, I'm going to select my sample. from the general ledger or 
a subledger, and you'd have to give the applicable subledger like the fixed asset register. Okay, and trace it to the source document. Again, what documents are we looking at? A contract, an invoice, what proves that it does exist? But now, see this. If it was an addition, uh, and they recorded the addition and it, and it really was there, then you would have tested that there was an invoice and therefore it should be. But it was subsequently disposed of, and if you don't see that, then you won't actually take it out of here and therefore it doesn't exist at your end. So just simply looking at a source document is not going to give me evidence that at year end it still actually exists. So my better plan would be to trace it to the physical item. If they have a physical item, I'm selecting it from the fixed asset register because it's there and I don't know if it should be there and I trace it to the physical item. If it's something that isn't physical, then I can get an external confirmation. And we're looking at I say 505 for external confirmation. Debtors, creditors, loan, anybody that there is a physical party but not a physical item. Okay, and then we've got some additional things that we can do. Specifically for debtors or maybe loans receivable. subsequent receipt testing. So what do we do? A debtor settles his amount. Remember, let's look at the revenue cycle. When he determines what he's going to pay, he sends us the remittance advice with all the invoices that he's going to pay, and then he makes payments. So subsequent receipt testing is saying, at year end, they've recorded this debtor, but as a Auditor, I'm not, I don't know if he's going to pay or not at year end. But we come in as auditors two months after year end, whenever the clients are ready for us. So the client, in preparing their financials, don't get to use information post year end because they've got to prepare at 31 December if that's the year end. But we come in in Feb. We can use any information that's come to our attention up until the day we leave to help us determine if their figures at year end are correct. So if a debtor has subsequently paid some of the balance at year end, then it can give us evidence that that balance did actually exist at year end because he's gone and paid for it. So my subsequent receipt testing, guys, you generally get about three marks here if you follow the correct procedure. How are you going to go about doing it? You would say, perform subsequent receipt testing on debtors or on loan receivable as follows. You're going to have to go and obtain the bank statement post year end and identify Receipts from debtors. Now I go and take those receipts, trace those receipts to the debtor's balance at your end and a remittance advice to determine. if the receipts relate to the year-end balance. Again, you'll have to write year-end out. And whatever portion of the receipt relating 
to the year in balance proves existence. So, I take the bank statement after year end. Identify any payments received from debtors after year end. Trace it to the debtors ledger to see that you know that's been removed from the debtor, but also then to the remittance advice to see which invoices he's settling. I can then see the invoices on the debtors ledger. I can see them on the remittance advice. And I can see which of those invoices relate to his year end balance, and that proves that that portion exists. Think about it, a debtor might be paying off the end, but he might be paying for an immediate order that he just placed and um, his old balance hasn't been settled. So that's why I have to go and make sure that the payment doesn't relate to a new amount, it relates to the balance at your end. And if there is any, that would prove existence for that. Okay, that's how I would test existence. So my opposite to this is completeness. And it's the risk that they have left items that should be included in the balance out. They're not in the balance, they should be, and therefore they've understated. So if I look here again, it was an addition that they didn't record so initial transaction was not recorded but then at year end that closing balance it's still missing so it should have been recorded wasn't recorded initially and now my closing balance is wrong because of that initial recognition not actually being recorded so again what do we have they get recorded for every source document there is, it should be recorded. So I can do my select a sample of source documents and trace to the GL or the subledger if there is one to identify missing included in the balance. But again, this is going to be more focused at your transactions. I could also do an analytical where I compare the prior year to the current year to identify potential missing balances. So if you think about it like if you worked on lists, you could do your prior loans. There's multiples or creditors, there's multiples. So where there's multiple items, I can do the list of last year to the list of this year to identify potential missing this year because they were on the list last year, so I assume they would be on the list this year. Otherwise, the nice one, if you haven't done it under your or general procedures to get your management grip letter, you can do it over here. Or for, again, for things like, I say again, but previously when we did subsequent receipts, we were looking at debtors or loans receivable, but we could look at creditors or loans payable and do subsequent payments testing to help us to identify items left out. So remember, subsequent receipts, we looked at receipts after year end. If they was re related to a balance at year end, it proved that that data did exist at year end because they subsequently have paid. Subsequent receipts is now trying to find any creditors that were not raised at year end. So how do we do it? Inspect the bank statements. Post your end for payments made. And now, those payments, we go and trace to the source documents to see 
when risks and rewards transfer. And if they transferred prior to year end, inspect that a liability was raised. at your end. So now this is me trying to find if they haven't raised the liability. So I go, okay, let me see payments after your end. Now let me see what that payment relates to. So I go to the invoice. This payment relates to an invoice that was dated the same day as the payment. So should a liability have been raised at your end? No, so that doesn't help me. But if this payment relates to an item where risks and rewards transferred before year end, I then go into the accounting records to see that there was a liability raised for that. And if there wasn't a liability raised for that, then they have not recorded all their liabilities. Because even though they paid for it after year end, there was a liability at year end and therefore they had to record it. Okay, I wouldn't worry too much here guys with completeness. It's very much focused at your your uh, liabilities and your creditors and so on. The biggest assertion, just like with your class of transaction assertions, which was dealing with the amount, accuracy at lot. So now with your balance dealing with the amount, valuation will have lot. So valuation is the risk that it is recorded at the incorrect year end amount. So why do we say year end amount? Because on initial recording, the transaction, on initial recording, it's recorded what IFRS says, the cost or removed it at the carrying amount. And it will be then tested here, we, or it should be recorded according to your class of transaction assertions, and we would do substantive testing on that initial recording here. But every transaction and the opening balance should have a subsequent measurement, according to IFRS, to land you at the closing amount. And now this is the risk, that these additions have not been subsequently measured to show that what they should be recorded at your end, and the opening balance hasn't been subsequently measured to show you what it should be at year end. And the disposal, up until the date that it was disposed, was not subsequently measured until it was disposed of. So those are all my risks, that at year end, the amount is incorrect. Now what I want you to, to think about is, when we're looking at that, what we've just discussed, that year end amount, we're dealing with that subsequent measurement. Because initial recognition will be according to the accuracy of that transaction. So think about it under two instances. Initial and subsequent measurements. That's what IFRA says, right? Initially recorded at this and subsequently recorded at this. So if you have not been, or yeah, if they've just said valuation, test valuation, then I would do initial recognition, testing the accuracy of the transactions during the year. So of your purchases or initial removal of your disposals during the year. And then I would do the subsequent measurement, which is testing your IFRS requirements. Okay, so make sure you split the two and test each. So initial testing the contract, the invoices, and so on. Subsequent from the date initial plus subsequent, all your opening balance needs to be re-measured. What is these types of remeasurements? It's depreciation. It's impairment. It's fair value adjustments. It's amortization. It's revaluations. 
So all of those need to be considered when we're looking at subsequent measurements. What do I know that all of these are? They are all estimates. And so I say 540 will help you with procedures for these. Standard procedures, guys, because it's an estimate, it differs with every single company, how they determine how they're going to test it. So you can't just go in and guns blazing start testing. You've got to understand that each company will have different policies. So my first step for testing subsequent measurements is always to inquire as to the accounting policy. What is the accounting policy? How do they depreciate? How do they amortize? What is the useful life? What is their fair value? And so on. Then, because they've given you it, you're going to have to test the consistency and reasonability. So how do you test the consistency? You can agree the policy to the prior year and test reasonability, you can compare the prior year amount to the current year amount to see if it's reasonable. Or with something like an allowance is raised in advance, you can compare the current year amount to the allowance raised in the prior have they provided enough to test reasonability i can also compare it to the market's policy to see if the policy is actually consistent and reasonable okay then we're going to have a calculation so you're going to have to recalculate because they're going to have to apply their policy now in getting it so remember when we tested for accuracy there were always calculations and before we actually recalculated we always tested the components that made up that calculation. So you will recalculate this estimate, but then you are going to have to agree the components of the calculation before, or we can do it, obviously you should do it before, but here I've put it after. So what I mean, how did they get to calculate that estimate? What did they use? So, debtors. They will, they will use the aging of their debtors. So you're going to have to test the aging of their debtors. How do I test the components? I say, okay, well, they've gone and said that every debtor in 90 days will be, they will create allowance for them. So I have to make sure that there are no debtors in 30 and 60 that actually should be in 90. So I'm going to say, okay, select a sample from each aging category. Trace it to the invoice to make sure it's aged correctly. Then I can go and agree that the 90, all the items in 90 were um, included to recalculate my estimate. So when again, when I say this, test the components, I don't want you to write that down. You will not get a mark for that because that doesn't tell anybody how to do it. You need to tell them how they should go about testing that calculation. To test the makeup of that calculation, the individual aspects, to make sure that everything within that is actually correct. And now, when you're looking at an estimate, there's still big concerns with it. So maybe here's when you want to go and use an expert to assist you. Remember, whenever you're discussing using an expert, whether it's your expert or management's expert, so if the question is purely, how do you audit the work of an expert, you need to do three things. Number one, test whether he's competent. Number two, test whether he's independent or let's say objective, because he wouldn't necessarily be independent, the auditor must be independent. And then once I'm comfortable with using the expert as a person, number two, I need to test the work. 
How do I test his competence? I'm going to go look at qualifications or journals he's published or past experience with them. How do I test if he's objective? I inquire about whether he's got any interests or relations, close relations within the business. And then, once I'm comfortable, I'll test his work. So I'm going to recalculate anything that he's done. Again, agree, agree the work, agree the work to the GL amount, test his assumptions, and then I'm comfortable. Using work of an expert, I say 620. Go have a look. It's splits, it's spreads it out like this for you guys. So you should be able to see, get the test the competence objective and then the work of that expert. Okay, so that is my valuation. Other than that, guys, sometimes what comes up in valuation are recons. So just also to be aware when they ask you to test a recon. You are testing from the GL to the subledger and making sure that those do match. You could also be asked to test the recon of an external doc to a subledger. So, what does that mean? Like something like testing the creditor's statement to the creditor's ledger. Okay, break, make sure you break it up. What are, what's on the creditor's statement? Make sure whatever they say is on the creditor's statement that's not on the creditor's ledger, make sure it's not on the creditor's ledger and it is on the creditor's statement um, and vice versa. So you will have reconciling items. You must test that those reconciling items are validly reconciling. Okay, then you're going to go and test them to the supporting documents to prove that they are right or um, should be included or shouldn't be. And again, casting and recalculating and so on for that. Then, we've got rights and obligations. I'm only going to focus on rights, guys, because obligations is the same as what you would do for completeness. So rights has got to do with your assets. Do they have the right to that asset? How do I test it? Obviously, the easiest thing is to inspect the rightful documents. So examples, your vehicle registration, if you're looking at a vehicle, um, your title deeds, if you're looking at a property, your contracts, if you're looking at something like an intangible. But the key isn't here. This isn't where the risk lies. The risk is that you have the right and you've maybe given them away. You've ceded them. Okay, so where you want to take out a loan, they won't let you. You say to them, you can have my debtors. If I default, you have ceded your rights. They are yours. The item is yours until you default. In which case, they now take the rights. So we just got to find out, have they got any cession or security or encumbrancement documents? Those three words all mean the same thing. So where would I look? I would inspect loan contracts or minutes of meetings. or bank confirmations for cession because that's where I would have ceded my rights in a loan contract or with the bank a bond for a bond on a, a property so that's where I'll look for any cession presentation disclosure guys same thing here go and test inspect the financial statements that it's been correctly presented and disclosed. So standard procedure, presentation and disclosure. You can go and copy it from your class of transaction assertions. So guys, that's what you're going to do for a balance. Again, 
Remember, look at the information in the question. Think about the things that, that are specific here. So again, if there's foreign items, remember, think things like your debtors and your creditors. If it's a monetary item at year end, it's got to be remeasured to the closing rate. So you're going to have to go and do a recalculation, not just the initial recording, which was at spot. The transaction must be recorded at spot. That's cool. But the closing balance for the, the monetary item, the debt or the credit or the bank, that must be remeasured to closing um, rate. Also, just having a look here with regards to your opening balances. If you were the prior auditors, that's great. You will go and agree to the prior um, closing balance in the prior financials. That's the procedure that you've got as, an, as a general procedure. If you weren't, then you're going to have to do some work on these open balances per ISA 510. Okay, and what does ISA 510 say? Obviously, you first do this. What else can you do? Review the prior working paper. So always go and do that if it's new. But if you can't review the prior working papers, the previous auditors have said they won't, you're going to have to do some work on those opening balances. So an external confirmation, if you can get that, you would do them both. You would have done it under existence for the closing, and now you can do it for the opening balance. That would be a nice one. You could also physically count now, like we said, so you can do your where we said select a sample and trace it to the physical item. You could physically count the items now, add back disposals, subtract additions, and get to your opening quantity. Okay, so you can do rollbacks to test that opening balance. Just go have a look at ISA 510. It gives you some examples specifically dealing um, with rollbacks, external confirmations, and reviewing prior working papers. That, guys, is what you need to be doing for an account balance.